goblins. Tools. I made this PCB on an SLA 3D printer. This is a fully fledged working PCB with a microcontroller and an LED and firmware and, and 0.5 millimeter pitch ICs. This is the real deal. This is a full circuit board. Now I didn't actually print this layer by layer like 3D printers normally work. I just used the printer to imprint my design onto one of these. This is what's called copper clad, which is a sheet of fiberglass with a thin layer of copper attached to it. And this is how every PCB starts out is with something like this. Then to actually get your design into it, you either mill out your traces with a CNC machine or you etch your design into the copper using an acid. The way that I made this one uses the acid technique. You start by putting something on the copper that's going to resist the acid, that's going to keep it from etching away the copper. But the trick is you only want to put it on the board where you want to keep the copper. Everything that's still exposed that the acid is going to touch is where it's going to eat it away. And this can be pretty hard to do. There's a lot of ways to do it. Some people will actually use printer toner where they print out their design using toner and then they iron it onto the board and then that resists the acid. Some people will spray paint the whole board with just normal spray paint and then they toss it into a laser cutter and use that to burn away the paint where they want to remove copper and the paint acts as the resist. And there's a, there's a bunch of other cheeky ways you can do this. But I'm using the Forbidden Blueberry Fruit Roll-Up. Yeah. And he's scared of stray light so we keep him in a little bag so, so he's not scared. The Fruit Roll-Up. This is a very thin, almost kind of goopy, kind of like a fruit roll-up, UV sensitive film. When you shine a UV light on this stuff, it solidifies. Very similar to 3D printer resin for an SLA printer. And that's why we keep it in the bag so it doesn't cure when we don't want it to. So, if I put the forbidden fruit roll up onto the copper board, toss it into an SLA printer, and then I use that printer to expose UV light onto the fruit roll up only where I want to keep the copper, and then I wash away all the uncured fruit roll up, I will literally just have the resist of where I want to keep the copper, which is exactly what I'm looking for. Sounds easy. I actually used to work at Formlabs, the 3D printer company. And so for one year for the company's hackathon, I actually tried to do this back in like 2019. And it was super lame. I did a really crappy job of applying the UV film. There was a ton of bubbles in between that and the copper. And I scrubbed too hard trying to remove the uncured resist. And like, it was just a mess. I had to do a bunch of bodge wires and like, it was just, it was a nightmare. I did try and 3D print a little solder mask layer and green resin on top of it after I had like kind of tried to do my etching, which was kind of cool, but the board itself didn't work at all. But some of my friends at Formlabs asked me if I wanted to come back for the hackathon this year. So I figured this would be a great opportunity to try and do it right and make a working PCB on an SLA printer. And this time using a Form 4 instead of a Form 2. So as soon as I get there, I bust out a quick little design with a microcontroller, a WS2012 LED, a little LDO, just like something that will take firmware and I can like visually show that it's doing something. And I really wanted to try a microcontroller with 0.5 millimeter pitch legs because that's such an important metric for so many components you might want to use. Then I prepped a bunch of test coupons. I cut out a bunch of little rectangles of copper and I cleaned them to high heaven. I sanded them down, I cleaned them with IPA wearing gloves, and I like meticulously applied the film to each one of them, making sure there were zero bubbles. I really didn't want film application to be a reason why potentially this whole thing didn't work out. And then I used a little bit of double-sided carpet tape to just attach it onto the build platform for the Form 4, which is great, but now I have to get the design onto the printer somehow to convince it to expose that pattern onto that film. My first thought was I would just SCP the PNG onto the printer, have it expose it for four or five seconds at full power, and then jog the build platform back up and done. But Formlabs does all this crazy pixel optics magic stuff in how they do the exposure. So I ended up going with more of a straightforward solution of just running a print. But the Form 4 is a printer. And when you try and use it for something that is not printing, it does not like that because it is a printer. And that's for good reason. But I had terminal access. And with the help of some current Formlabs engineers, we disabled a bunch of checks in the printer so it would let us do some 3D printing crimes. The first thing we had to do is change the point at which the Z gantry came down for the curing because we've now added about two millimeters of thickness onto the build platform with the 1.6 millimeter PCB and the adhesive. We also got cartridge detection disabled so we didn't have to worry about it dumping resin into the tank while we're trying to expose the PCB. But the one thing that we had a really hard time disabling was level sense. This is the system the printer uses to see how much resin is in the tank and it uses a little ultrasonic sensor that's kind of floating over the resin. There's a lot of things in place in the firmware to make sure that this is what it needs to be in order to be successful and it was a lot to try and disable it so so the quickest way ended up being just folding up some cardboard and putting it in the tank and tricking the sensor into thinking there was resin. And this worked great. So then I exported my PCB from KiCad in an SVG and I extruded that into a 0.1 millimeter thick print, imported that into Preform, which is the slicer for Formlabs printers, 
and I sent it off to the Form 4 to print as a one layer high temp resin print. After it was done, I looked at the design on the film and it looked like it was barely there. Like I could barely tell that anything had even happened. So to be safe, I ran it a few more times because I just, I really wanted to make sure the whole thing wasn't just gonna peel off. So I think I ran it about six passes total, six curing cycles, just to really make sure it was baked on there. And it looked great afterwards. Like you could see the pattern. You could see it very, very specifically that my PCB had been encoded into this thing. It was very cool. After I scrubbed off all the unexposed fruit roll up and I put it in the acid bath and etched away the copper, it was very clear I overexposed it with six passes. A lot of the traces were fine and came out okay, but all of the pins on the microcontroller, the 0.5 millimeter pitch, that really tricky part, none of that resolved. They were all shorted together. So I think there was just a lot of UV curing bleed between all the pads and they all just shorted out. Also, this is literally the same roll of film that I had when I tried this in 2019. So like it's old, maybe that's why too. But either way, the next time I tried it, I only cured it twice and that was perfect. When I was scrubbing off all the uncured film, which you do in just some cold water and some borax, everything stayed on except for one loose little STM32 leg pad, which was not connected to anything else. So it didn't really matter but everything else stayed on great and it looked awesome. It looked really good. And then I etched it using ferric chloride, which is the closest real life equivalent to the dip from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It is the most evil stuff. It's just it's horribly bad. There are a few different types of chemicals that you can use to etch your PCB, but this is the most common and it's the most effective. If you do etch with this kind of stuff, please dispose of it the right way. You have to like talk to your municipality and like see how they'd like you to dispose of it. It's kind of a pain in the butt, but please do it. Like do not put this stuff down your drain. It is so bad to do that, but you can reuse it a ton. So like don't immediately discard it after you're done. You can get a lot of boards out of like one bottle of this stuff. Just do not dip your cartoon shoes into it because it will destroy them. <laughs> but hilariously, it's totally fine with plastic. So a Form 4 tank was like a wonderful little container to do this etching in. After I saw that all the exposed copper had been fully cleaned away, I took it out and dried it off a little bit in a paper towel. And then I dipped it in some acetone. And this is to loosen up the cured UV film a little bit. So it'll come off a bit easier. And it did. It came right off after the acetone was on it for just a little bit. And it it looks so good. Look at this. Look how freaking cool this is. Like crazy fine feature resolution. It came out great. This is small feature stuff. It's not like good enough to make your iPhone, but it's for like pretty much most stuff you might want to make at home. It's going to be able to do this process is kind of the vibe I was getting at this point. So then I brought it over to the Formlabs EE microscope to like really see how it came out. So the first thing you'll notice from this whole view is that there's a lot of dark semicircular shapes around the edges of these copper pads. And I believe this is the etchant kind of weaseling its way underneath the fruit roll up and starting to eat away the copper kind of like down from the sides. I think this might be because the film was too old and also maybe I let it etch for too long, but it didn't actually affect the usability of the board really in any spot that I could find. It reduced the thickness of the copper, but it never like fully broke through the whole thing, which was great. There were a couple spots where it was broken through, but I think this was because of film application or me scrubbing too hard, trying to remove the uncured stuff before I put it into the acid. So here, oh, this is devastating. This is right underneath the crystal, which is a big flat rectangular part and it's broken right underneath it. So I ended up having to bodge this closed, which ended up being okay and it worked fine, but like, this is the single worst place I could have had a break. <laughs> All the pins on the STM32 are separate isolated pads. A few of them looked like they were just barely touching and I did clean them up a little bit with an X-Acto knife before I moved on to the next step. But for the most part, it seemed like they resolved really well. Their shapes are a little uneven and I don't really know why this is the case. Probably some artifact of the film being inconsistent and old, but like it did the thing. They're still workable pads. They're still solderable. They're isolated almost completely for the most part. And because this was a single sided board, I didn't do a backside of this copper. I just did one layer. When I was designing it, I couldn't use vias. I couldn't use the backside of the theoretical PCB this would go to. So instead I had to use zero ohm jumpers and route traces underneath those jumpers and kind of like use that as my second side of the board. I only had to do two in the design, but even these came out great. These are thin little traces going underneath an 0805 jumper. And like, this was fine. It kind of looks a little spooky here. It looks like it's kind of eating into that trace, but like there was copper the whole way down. That's just a shadow from the way the lighting is showing on this image. I was so, oh, so stoked. I was so stoked about this result. So then I meticulously soldered the, I don't know, half a dozen parts onto this board. I was so careful. It took me like 90 minutes to get all these six parts onto this board. We got five volts on it. 
So we're just, nothing should happen. It should just be magic smoke check here. Okay. That's good news. That is a good sign. Let's check a couple voltages. Okay, didn't hit its current limit. Good, yeah, we're at like six milliamps, so that's excellent. I'm guessing if you have, you have a 1117 on there? Yeah. That's about the quiescent current of one of those. Beautiful, I love yeah. that you just know that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just make sure we have our five volts actually coming in. Yep, beautiful. Yep, we're regulating 3.3. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that like, probably works. Okay, so now I need to get my Blackmagic probe. So the power test passed, and then I wrote a quick little bit of firmware just to check for life, check that I could talk to it over SWD, and it would light up the WS2812 LED, and it just took it. First try, it just took firmware, and the LED lit right up. Okay, so real talk, fireside chat time. I did the thing. How viable is this really as a potential process for making PCBs? Is this like actually a thing you should do or is this just like a cool thing you saw on the internet? I would say pretty decent. It has its drawbacks, but it totally freaking works. It's going to be pretty hard to do double-sided boards with this method, but like to be totally fair, it's hard to do double-sided boards with most any method. Even on something like the other mill, which is like this tiny dedicated PCB milling thing, they had their methods of making it pretty consistent, but it was still a bit of a thing to make a double-sided board. And if you have your own CNC and you're just like taking exported toolpaths from KiCad and trying to do cam on them, it's good. It's also going to be hard. <laughs> Double-sided boards are tricky to do at home. So I don't think that necessarily is a point against because that's kind of just the nature of the game at this point. And I did get away with some jumpers pretty well here. Like I was still able to get a second side of the board pretty easily. So if you're designing for this system, it's not terrible. Now, if I tried to prototype the Lumen PMP motherboard on this thing, no, I don't. <laughs> not only is that a four layer board, but like there's just a lot going on in that thing. That might be a little trickier. But for a quick PCB to have like a permanent, nicer than a breadboard, nicer than a perf board solder job situation, it's pretty good. It does the job. I did have to do some hacky stuff to the printer to like get it to do this, but I think it might be possible to do this without all the hacks that I had to do, like not needing SSH control to the printer. You might still be able to make this happen. I can imagine where all of the different processes that you're putting a PCB through in this whole rigmarole are all just in different tanks and you toss it into a printer that has PCB mode and it has copper clad already on the build platform and you just put in a series of tanks and the printer will prompt you for a different tank and it goes through and does a different wash or like a variant of the Form 4 wiper that actually has a little brush on the top of it and it will like scrub your PCB a little bit in that chemical solution. Like you could, you could make it like just a procedural one-stop setup station for making PCBs in a printer. I think that'd be sick and I think it might be pretty viable. It would just be a matter of swapping the tank a few times. Like, that'd be wicked cool. Also, Formlabs has interestingly decided to start opening up a bunch of stuff with their printer of like letting you control a bunch of settings and use different resins and like, they have an API for controlling stuff. Like, they're, I was really surprised to see that they decided to do this. Typically, you don't see a large company with a hardware and like DRM materials like open up control, which was, pretty sick. It's gated behind a pretty hefty license fee, but like the fact they're even taking a step in this direction is, is really cool. And I'm glad to see that they're starting to do this and like opening it up for people to mess with their hardware more and try stuff like this, do cool new weird stuff with their hardware. Of course, I am incredibly open source minded. Everything we make here at Opula is open source. The Lumen PMP is open source. I feel like generally it is better to give your users control over their hardware so they fully own it. But either way, cool that they're doing that. And the printer's sick. They did not sponsor this video or anything. Like I truly just went out there to have fun and see friends and like use the machine. It is a really cool printer. It's an awesome, awesome printer. And it was cool that I was able to go and like mess around with it and hack it a little bit to get it to do this. Anyway, I am on a bit of a PCB fabrication kick after this and I got something. Do you want to see? Oh. Did I crunch it? 
Xtools sent me a big fiber laser and these things can ablate copper. So I'm gonna try and make circuit boards on this fiber laser and see how that goes. And a quick search for other people trying to do something like this on YouTube shows me that it's possible. This is gonna be huge for being able to make PCBs yourself at home. This machine's at the higher end of the price tag at like four grand, just under depending. But this tech is only going to get cheaper as time goes on. So next time we're gonna dive into seeing how making PCBs on a fiber laser works. But until then, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Peas and carrots, crazy cats and ish kabibble. Peas and carrots, peas and carrots, peas and carrots. This is what's called copper clad, which is a sheet of, I almost said plywood. That's not real. <laughs>